Hello, folks, and welcome back to World War II TV. Did you miss me those three days when I was in Dieppe? Did you miss me? Um, uh, I missed you, but uh, it was all filming for the August 19th Dieppe special we have coming up, which I'm really looking forward to. So we couldn't be there live during the day, but I've got all this great footage on the beaches, which we'll be bringing to you then. So that's why I'm back now. But here, Sunday night, got a show for you. So this is in my series of kind of random subjects that don't really fit into a theme week, but it's something that has been in the back of my mind since I started World War II TV because of the interest I had with uh, my friends who made the film Go For Broke about the 442nd and, and the Japanese Americans on Hawaii. And, and I thought, well, at some point I will try and move into the, the actual um, uh, camps type scenario. And it all met, hinged on finding the right person to discuss it. So when I found the right person to discuss it, hence here we are. So my guest tonight, joining me from New Orleans, uh, Dr. Stephanie Schitz, good evening or good afternoon for you. How are you today? I'm good, how are you? I'm tickety-boo, thank you. So this is an interesting subject. We're here to talk about the the movement of Japanese Americans into various camps and work programs. And the thing that I think we just had a little pre-chat there that's going to be really interesting tonight is the use of language and what, how you describe these camps, how you dis uh, talk about the relocation, what words were used by the people then, what words are used now, what you, words were used 30 years ago in the historiography of this. But... Before we get into that, where, tell us about your background and your interest in Asian history and, and how you got involved in this. Sure. So I will say right now I'm a historian at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. So I'm coming to you from New Orleans and it is afternoon here for me. I got my PhD in 20th century U.S. history in 2013 from the University of Maryland. And I actually would not have considered myself an expert in the area of Japanese American incarceration. I obviously knew about World War II and had to know about it to, to write some of my other stuff, but I kind of came backwards into the topic of uh, World War II and especially the Japanese American experience because I originally was interested in Asian American history. And so that led me to this topic. And what I found in the literature is that a lot of historians treated this time period in American history as some kind, some somehow separate from everything else. So a very special, unique moment that didn't quite fit into what we tend to think of World War II history being. So not even the home front. A lot of people think of Rosie the Riveter and uh, the Double V campaign among African Americans. But to me, it just seemed like it was it was this topic that didn't make its way into the bigger story of World War II or even the bigger story of American history. And so I started to become really interested in thinking about ways to connect it because it's not just this separate weird moment in US history that's disconnected to everything else. And it's certainly just as much of an important part of American World War II history as a lot of other things. And so that's, as I did more research, I found the labor angle to this topic and also how how closely it was connected with the military and especially the army and how they they viewed the camps and labor and the whole incarceration project as really part of their own military strategy. So just did a lot of research, did a lot of background reading, got, got the opportunity to look at a lot of neat primary sources in the National Archives, especially communication between army officials and government officials. And then, like you said, the issue of language. So that's become really important for a lot of things that I do with this topic. So that's kind of how I became how I became interested in it. And well, perfect uh, introduction explanation there. And I think sometimes when I do shows here on, on the channel about, I don't know, the tanks or something, and it's about tanks in World War II, the lessons of that have absolutely no impact to us today. They help us understand how the battles uh, were fought, but they don't have any bearing on our society today, the, the, the production numbers of a Tiger tank in 1943. But the relations between different peoples that were living in a country during times of adversity is absolutely a bang on topical subject. So, you know, we're, we're still dealing with issues. We're still dealing with, you know, in, in France and Britain, where I'm from and, and the USA integration issues and how to label people and people get very precious about their labels and what they want to be called and what they don't want to be called. And, and so mm -hmm. it, it's, it's fascinating for me to do a show that is rooted in World War Two, but actually it's almost a current affairs show as well because of yeah. its because of its topicality. So with, as usual, with all my guests, you've, you've given us a bit of a PowerPoint presentation to, 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 to move things along. And of course, folks, if you're watching, if you've got questions or comments, bring them in as we're going along and we'll, we'll go from there. But I, 
we'll, we'll, we'll hand over to Steph to kind of explain some things to us and we'll all hopefully learn something. I, I certainly, in just looking at your slides, I learned a few things. So tell us about the, the whole program, how it started, and then, and then I'll jump in with my usual interruptions when I feel appropriate. Awesome. Thank you. So I'll start kind of in the beginning with where the incarceration project comes from and how it came to be. So this Pearl Harbor is obviously very crucial to this story. So after the attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941, there are a lot of underlying tensions among many different American groups, the military and the government about what to do with Americans of Japanese descent. So there's a lot of long, there's a, there's a long legacy of looking at Japanese Americans, so not just Japanese immigrants, but um, Japanese American citizens, so those born in this country, as uh, somehow un-American, they're very closed off ethnically, they are unassimilable, so they're, they're not able to be kind of grouped in or worked into American society culturally or, or politically. At this point, Japanese immigrants can't uh, naturalize and become American citizens. So it's almost like they have everything, the cars are stacked against them from sort of day one. So when you get Pearl Harbor, there's like this ready-made platform for people to start questioning, are Japanese Americans, no matter what, if they're immigrants or they're you know, born here in the United States, where are their loyalties going to fall? Are they still loyal to the emperor? And if that's the case, are they going to be subversive, form a fifth column, um, especially along the West Coast? And that's a phrase that was used by the military and the government all the time. Or are they going to kind of prove their patriotism and show everyone that they are very American and they're going to get behind the war effort? Unfortunately, <laughs> what happens is you have a general. So this is John DeWitt who is uh, placed in charge of the Western Defense Command. And so I think there's a map on the next slide, perhaps, yeah, yeah there it is. So John DeWitt is, he's known as, he's a logistics guy. Um, he has not seen combat, he was a former quartermaster. He sees himself as being very good at moving things from point A to point B. And once uh, he's, he's placed in, the, in charge of the WDC actually before Pearl Harbor, and once Pearl Harbor happens, again, that question of what do you do with the Japanese American community comes kind of front and foremost in his mind. So along the West Coast, this is where you have the largest numbers of Japanese Americans living in the United States. So they're all kind of centered there. They they live across the country, but that's really right right along that area of the coast. That's that's where the largest communities are. So there's a lot of questions in January to early February about are there going to be problems? Do we have to worry about Japanese Americans assisting Japan with another attack? And this is something that DeWitt becomes his subordinates say almost obsessed with. He becomes incredibly obsessed with the idea that there's going to be another air attack along the West Coast, if not another, or if not an invasion by the Japanese. It's like he has a one-track mind almost. He's also thinking about other, quote, enemy aliens. So these would be immigrants from uh, Germany and Italy, who, of course, will also become our, our enemies in the United States, enemies during the war. But predominantly, he's thinking about Japanese, um, Japanese Americans. And at this time in the government, up to the very highest reaches, so going all the way up to FDR, there's a lot of prejudice against Japanese. And I will use the term racism. I'll say first and foremost, whenever you use the term racism to talk about the past, whether it's the 1940s, the 20s, or the 30s, but we'll stick with World War II, it's a very complicated term. And it means a lot of different things in different eras. So when I use the term racism at the time, people would have more likely used the word prejudice. And it gets really complicated and tied up with ethnicity, but also, again, where, where those political loyalties are with the Japanese. So DeWitt and others like him believe that more than Germans and Italians, Japanese had the potential to be problematic. And so during the month of January, 1942, up until early February, there's a flurry of conversations going on amongst DeWitt and his subordinates. Um, Colonel Carl Bendenson will become very important in this story as well. He's gonna work with DeWitt to kind of tease out what needs to be done about the West Coast. 
When it comes to FDR, we have plenty of evidence. There's been a lot of great books written to demonstrate that FDR had a lot of prejudiced ideas against the Japanese people as a whole. He had individual Japanese friends from Harvard that he knew, but when it came to thinking about the community, a lot of really stereotypical notions, again, natural ties to the emperor, just not really able to be trusted when kind of the rubber hits the road idea. So FDR's advisors, many of them are telling him, we might need to be concerned about Japanese immigrants, or technically those would be enemy aliens, but we don't necessarily need to be concerned about American-born citizens of Japanese descent. So most of his advisors are saying, if you want to think about interning uh, Japanese immigrants like Italian immigrants or German immigrants, those who are nationals who are here and aren't citizens, that's one thing. But do not, do not consider removing Japanese American citizens from the West Coast and putting them into camps. That's going to create a constitutional crisis. You have um, uh, J. Edgar Hoover at the time also advising FDR, again, maybe be concerned about the nationals, but not so much about the American born citizens. Within the military, DeWitt at the time, so even like early mid January, he's not entirely convinced that we need to be concerned about the second generation of American born Japanese either. So there seems to be a lot of momentum that what this is going to be is very similar to World War I, where we're going to focus on the nationals, the enemy aliens, and not get into the American citizens. That's a little bit of a trickier concept. Um, but by early February, DeWitt's uh, subordinate, Carl Benenson, he is a young guy. He kind of, he starts out in law, so he's a JAG officer, and he's going to like skyrocket <laughs> um, up to, he's going to get promoted to major. I think he's like 32, 32 or 33 when he gets promoted to major. And he is much more inclined to be suspicious of American citizens of Japanese descent than DeWitt. There's a lot of explanations for why that is. Historians have done some kind of neat, almost like psychological work into Benetson and have discovered that his own, he has an immigrant background himself. And there's almost this kind of self loathing about the ties that he has to his parents mm. being immigrants. So there's there's this argument that uh, it's kind of twofold. Like on one hand, he's kind of internalized these anti-immigrant ideas um, to try and be more American. But then on the other, this, this would be a good opportunity for him to kind of prove himself, especially working under DeWitt. So he's going to do a lot of work in convincing DeWitt that he should be just as concerned about American citizens as he is about foreign born Japanese. And Benetson is going to do a lot of work. He's actually going to have a really heavy hand in writing Executive Order 9066, um, which FDR is going to sign in February of 42. And that's going to be the impetus for what becomes known as Japanese American incarceration. And we're, we'll get to the, mm -hmm. the terminology about that in a little bit. So the the order over here, and that's that's what will be what's what's on the screen here. That is um, DeWitt's order as basically commander of the Western Defense. That's what he uses to put this into action. Um, but at first, Executive Order 9066, which is signed by FDR, never explicitly mentions Japanese. It just talks about enemy enemy aliens more generally along the West Coast. So theoretically, that also includes Italians and Germans. Um, on the West Coast, DeWitt is going to declare and establish two military zones. That's a power that is granted to him by FDR. They're going to be along the West Coast, so like right hugging, hugging the coast and then further into the interior in a little bit. And there are Italians and Germans, uh, nationals, who are going to be subject to curfews in cities on the West Coast. Um, initially, there is discussion about how many are going to be removed? Are any going to be removed? But by the time you get to late February, DeWitt will focus explicitly on removing um, large scale Japanese. And that's, you can see on, on the order here, anyone of Japanese ancestry. So that includes nationals and Japanese Americans. So, so one, just, to, just to backpedal a little bit, um, yeah. Steph. So because you're saying about this assessment of what risks um, foreign nationals other uh, you know people from ancestry if they had assessed that the people of japanese uh, german or italian ancestry were also at risk and if they think this is a big risk 
trying to round up in turn all the German and Italian America would have just been absolutely physically impossible because it would have been millions. I mean, not just a few thousand, millions. So, so I completely understand that the way Germany declared war on the USA was very different than the way Japan ended up declaring war, as you said, Pearl Harbor, two very different acts. Both, both have the same net result of bringing the war to the USA, but one is distinctly interpreted different to the other. But this idea of, you know, you're talking about this colonel wanting to kind of do it, but have a project that he can see himself moving up the career ladder. The, managing Japanese Americans as a project is a project you can actually see a result coming out of. If he if he gets a if he has a meeting and say, here's how we're going to focus on the Germans and Italians, it would just be impossible. I mean, the manpower involved, the paperwork, the where, where would you I mean the entire cities across the USA would be stripped? I mean, I, one of the facts I always say in Normandy uh, in, is that something like 55 percent of American troops have German extraction. Something mm -hmm. so you know, a, a amount of time as I've taken Ameri Ger uh, uh, Americans with German extraction and their relative was in the first division on Omaha Beach, but their relative's cousin was in the German division and buried at Lacombe Cemetery. So mm -hmm. it, it just it's staggering numbers. So this assessment. Sure, that they, they, they were trying to look at the risks, but also there was a practicality about what could actually be achieved. And yep. then there's the layer of prejudice, stroke, mm -hmm. racism as well. So there's there's several things going on back there. But the, the, clearly, the German Italian thing got dismissed pretty pretty quickly. I mean, is there anything yep. written down about how that was dismissed? Yeah. So you you're exactly right. There are conversations among military officials and government officials about just how impossible it would be to try and do something similar with German Americans and Italian Americans as with Japanese Americans. It, it's tricky. Um, also, the, I mean, the sheer numbers you would if you especially are thinking about like, we'll say Germans of American descent. So or Germans yeah. People with German ancestry will use the same terminology as, yeah, as that yeah. order. You know, German Americans, no matter what generation, they're huge and everywhere. You know, if you look along the East Coast, um, I'm from Pennsylvania originally. If you're talking about rounding up like German Americans, people of German ancestry, it goes most of the state. Um, if you talk about doing the same thing like in New York City with Italian Americans, similar thing. So like logistically, the streets would be deserted very quickly. Yeah, they? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it would be absolutely impossible. Um, so that's logistically speaking is one of the reasons why you see a move away from doing something similar with people who are American citizens, but of Italian and German descent as what is done with people who are American citizens but of Japanese descent. Mm. So that is certainly something that is taken into consideration. If you sort of jump over to Hawaii, where in Hawaii, I, I wanna say Japanese, anyone of Japanese descent makes up like 37% of the population in Hawaii. There were similar conversations there. Um, the ethnic makeup of Hawaii is, is very interesting and nuanced. So that plays a part in it. But also um, the argument is if you take all people of Japanese descent in Hawaii, and try and remove them and transfer them to put them <laughs> put them in camps in the US, logistical nightmare. And also you're gonna completely tank Hawaii's economy. So like, I mean, Japanese there are so integral to to everything. Yeah, just that, the infrastructure of Hawaii infrastructure. depended on that, didn't it? So I mean, and yeah. someone, Brad from um, on this dang Canadian history asked, are we going to, is, is Steph gonna be talking about Hawaii? Because it is a completely separate, yeah situation there through you know if, in, with regards to everything not just internment but also with with troop you know providing mm -hmm. volunteers for the army how every, every, everything hawaii was a completely separate yeah. situation with, with regards yeah. to everything so um yeah, yeah i'm glad you touched on it but yeah um, it's it's very unique and there's something else that's different between hawaii and the mainland u.s is the relationships that Japanese people have with, uh, you know, not just white Americans, but people of, of all different ethnicities and races. In Hawaii, a lot of historians will make a generalization. It is generally true, there's always nuance there, that just sort of the, the racial relationships in Hawaii are not the same as the relations between Japanese, uh, people of Japanese descent on the West Coast and like white farmers there. Hawaii is different. There's not as much economic competition with Japanese and other groups like there is on the West Coast. So there's a lot of differences with relationships that kind of play out with how things are very different for Japanese in Hawaii. 
Um, but yet, I mean, logistically speaking, mm -hmm. it's also very challenging. Now, something else that happens too, FDR is a New Deal Democrat. So he, um, I mean, his presidency is doing pretty well. He's he's a popular president, but it doesn't mean that he has no opposition. And he, he does need to get support for some of his New Deal programs that he established during the Depression. He still needs political support for those, even during the war. And so another kind of powerful element to this story is who is lobbying for Japanese American removal and incarceration and who is lobbying against doing something similar for Italian and German Americans. So the Democratic Party is kind of uh, is kind of forcing their hands on FDR from all different angles. You have uh, very powerful Democrats from California who are basically saying to FDR and the military, you got to do something about this. We're vulnerable. Um, there could be another attack, whereas in some place like New York City, where there are, again, powerful Italian-American Democratic politicians, they are saying to FDR, do not even think about it. Don't even think about trying to do what you're, go what you're gonna do with Japanese Americans with the Italian Americans. So it's, the whole thing is political, um, log like logistics, and then there's the military element, again, where, where DeWitt is very convinced that we need to be concerned about any person of Japanese descent because there's something inherently kind of different from them. So once uh, Executive Order 9066 is signed in, in February 42 by FDR, the whole project goes into the hands of DeWitt and then um, Benenson, who was in that photo right there, kind of pointing pointing to the pointing to the map. Um, so that leaves uh, DeWitt to establish, yeah, the two restricted zones there, perfect. So those are the zones that he establishes. And uh, those are the zones that he will say are most vulnerable to another potential air attack or even invasion. Um, as the war kind of goes on, especially uh, after Midway, that starts to shift a little bit. It starts to become clear that might not be such an issue, but DeWitt never gives it up. Um, so these are the zones where if you are a Japanese American citizen or national, um, you will be required to leave those areas. You will be removed um, where you're going to be moved to. For the army, that's not immediately necessarily its problem. There's gonna be another agency, the War Relocation Authority, which is civilian. They're gonna deal with the camp. So for the army, you know, if DeWitt's looking at this map, his primary concern is getting Japanese Americans out of those two areas and getting them someplace else. So DeWitt, his whole goal, and, and Benetson's goal as well, was to do the, the moving job, move the people out of those areas, and then what happens to them after that, not necessarily the Army's concern. They're, they're talking about logistics. Um, Benetson's gonna be hailed as, uh, he's gonna be praised for doing, you know, quote, the one of the largest moving jobs in American history. So just moving people out, he's going to be praised for that. But um, that's sort of how the early steps of this project begin. It's a lot of movement. Um, the Japanese Americans can move voluntarily. They have a period from when Executive Order 9066 is signed in February up until like the end of May if they can find some place to live beyond those two those two areas on their own, well, then they're not gonna, they don't have to be interned or incarcerated. Um, they won't need to be put into a camp. They can make arrangements on their own. It's very difficult to do. Um, it's not easy and you've only got like three months to try and find people to take over your land and your property, but it is possible. And DeWitt had hoped a lot more Japanese Americans would do this voluntarily then actually ended up happening. So that was sort of the first hitch in his plan that not as many Japanese Americans were able to do that, which kind of confuses him. He thought, well, if you had an opportunity to do this voluntarily, why wouldn't you? But he's not thinking about how difficult it would be um, for someone who lives in this community to find a neighbor who's you know sympathetic to take over your land. Uh, but when you know you get you get May of 1942 when the time for voluntary evacuation is ending. The army is going to transfer Japanese Americans from their homes um, with the assistance of like local law enforcement, FBI agents are gonna be helping as well um, just to kind of do like double loyalty checks. They're gonna be placed in temporary, what the government calls assembly centers, and they will be in those, in those two zones, they're only temporary. Um, 
where they are going to be kept and they are going to wait to be assigned to one of the more permanent camps, which will be out farther past those zones, which are going to be overseen by the War Relocation Authority. Some, so from February until like May, June of 1942, um, Japanese Americans are the responsibility of the army, um, of the military. The goal is for DeWitt and others is once the Japanese Americans are processed, they leave those assembly centers, then it will be primarily out of the military's hands. He won't have to deal with it. And he can go back to focus on training in the Western Defense Command, moving materials, getting them from point A to point B. That was the goal. So for the Army, the goal is to just remove the Japanese Americans. They're a risk, get them out. For the War Relocation Authority, the civilian agency, that it's going to be a different priority for them. They're going to have to maintain the camps. They're going to have to think of uh, different ways to kind of socialize Japanese Americans and think about where they're going to go and what they're going to do after. So it's there's there's two different kind of elements to that. So that's a very long <laughs> explanation of, of the backstory, but how we get from point A, Pearl Harbor, there's this attack to, um, you know, 120,000 Japanese Americans the overwhelming majority of them, close to 80%, are American-born citizens. Mm -hmm. How do they end up from their homes on the West Coast to being um, in these in these camps? So just to, just to jump in again for, for clarification. So, because you're talking about the period from December 41 to May, June 1942, because while this is all planning, their these zones, this is when the war is, lots of things are happening in the war. I mean, we did our midway show just very recently. We're breaking the Jap some of the Japanese codes. We can able to give them a, a find out they've got midway on, mm -hmm. in the, on the horizon. We know that's happening there. We're, so uh, during this point, is no one stepping in and saying, hang on, this perceived threat of the West Coast, you know what? It's probably not going to happen now. Is this still, are we still going to do this? Is no one kind of stepping in and saying the situation has changed? Because it's not, you know, move, this move, moving of people, the construction of camp, this is money. This is, oh, is no one kind yeah. of going, to, are you sure? Because, you know, I'm thinking about Britain in that period. Mm -hmm. There's the public, there's the perceived threat and there's public opinion and what the public are scared about. And, then, you know, in Britain, we had all these things about, German paratroopers just dressed as nuns jumping out into into country and 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 procedures were set up. Police stations had warnings up saying if you see a particularly tall nun with a German accent, kind of contact your <laughs> local policeman. But it kind of withered away very quickly, and they realized, you know what, this isn't. We're not going to get German paratroopers dressed as nuns jumping, and it kind of any any attempt to kind of focus on that was just kind of washed away so but, but nothing's happening in in the usa to kind of go we don't need this anymore so that one of the interesting things is well first of all dewitt he will actually go before congress and he will testify I want to say this is 1943 so it's early like we're not even that far into this whole thing yet um and even as early as 1943 people are starting to wonder, is this absolutely necessary? Because like you said, this is costing a lot of money. And, and you know, maybe I can get into this later, but the War Relocation Authority is a bureaucratic nightmare. Um, it is poorly managed. The camps are even poorly managed. They're, they are not, uh, it's, it's not a well-functioning, efficient organization. And it's, it's gonna get a bad reputation very soon into, into the program. Um, DeWitt is, he's going to stick with it. He really never, ever denies or <laughs> tries to think that there's not a concern about the Japanese American community. So he's, he's so like, he well, doubles down. He, 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 he doubles down. He just, okay, well, I'm going yeah. with this. There is a threat. And, you know, again, we, you know, I know you've got to touch on the racial racism side of things. And, you know, we have to understand that Japan was closed off as a country for 100 years, 100 yeah. years earlier. We, 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 the Western allies, know a lot less about Japan than we would know about Germany and Britain. Mm -hmm. We know the Germans. They're our neighbors. We fought alongside them against Napoleon not really that many years before, really, in the grand scheme of things. And the right. Japanese, there's a real sense of it being very, very different. So I understand all that and that that inbuilt mistrust of of cultures you don't understand and and i get all that but it's just it's fascinating that once the role that once the role the steamroller starts going there's no way of stopping it and that i guess is how 
lots of things are in World War II that we now realize with hindsight were unnecessary. I mean, the, the production of gas masks for, mm -hmm. for civilians are carried on for years, and yet we yeah. never, you know, never had to use them. Um, so yeah. I will say a, another interesting thing, um, and it always strikes me, um, even today, how successful the government propaganda was during World War II in convincing Americans that this whole incarceration project, uh, it might not be ideal. Um, you, we might not like seeing American citizens, no matter of what racial, ethnic identity they are, imprisoned and being behind barbed wire and under military guard, um, but this is a time of war. And sometimes during war, we have to do things that aren't ideal, uh, not only to protect us. This is not me saying this. This is like mm. at the moment that like sometimes we have to do these things to protect ourselves. But another uh, very important piece of propaganda, a message that the government and the military put out for the American people um, is that the government is removing this group of Americans and placing them in their camps for their own protection. And the explanation they give is that because we're in a time of war and because we're at war with Japan, there could be some really violent reactions in this, in this paranoid, hysteria-driven environment. And so the argument says if we left Japanese Americans on the West Coast, where the anti-Japanese sentiment was the worst, mm. they could be vulnerable to violent attacks. They could be vulnerable to a murder. Who knows what if we left them there? And there's some so, logic in that. That, that, that. that there's some, I don't say I agree with it, but there is yeah. some logic. And then you, you add that to this inherent fear people on the West Coast have. And, and yeah. you can understand it was quite an easy sell yeah, to, it to was. most of the population then. It seems horrible now. We're aghast at this project 70 plus years later. But mm -hmm. at the time, I don't think it was a particularly hard project to convince people this is every, in everybody's best interests. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it was not. And, you know, you, you bring up a really good question about, like, was there anyone being like, wait, this sounds absolutely ridiculous? And, and there certainly were. And there were um, many, many Americans who deep down didn't like this idea. They did not like what was happening. You know, maybe they're not fans of the Japanese community, but doesn't this make the United States look kind of bad uh, when we're supposed to be fighting against like fascism and we're fighting for democracy and liberty and all this stuff? Um, and there's certainly servicemen who will, towards the end of the war, write back about this. And they're not happy with anti-Japanese sentiment. They're saying like, what the hell are we doing? Like when we're fighting for all these grand ideas and look what you're doing to American citizens. So it's, uh, you know, Americans are questioning this there are plenty who think it's the absolutely right thing to do because Japanese cannot be trusted. But there are other Americans who it's it's I think about it's it's very similar to how Americans approach things today that we do in the United States, where deep down we know it's not right, but maybe it's necessary. And if the government can convince them that, yeah, it's not right, but it is necessary, which is exactly what the government was able to do with incarceration. And that that line about this is for the safety and the benefit of Japanese Americans as much as it is to protect the United States is a really strong selling point. And it yeah, really that's, that's your first pitch, isn't it? If you're, if you're, that's the one you bring out first, because it, yep. it gives the impression that you're soft and caring and that you, you, you just have everybody's best interests at heart. But then in many ways, that's how lots of awful things are introduced by people in a, hiding it behind a veil of this is for your own good. And this is for mm -hmm. their good. And we, we have your interests. I mean, that's, you know, and not that we're going to go into talking about Jews in Europe, but that's you know, it starts off with register yourself here so we can help you there. We can help your communities, you know, be aware of each other. It's it's the the beginnings of it are very seemingly innocent about mm -hmm. paperwork. And then it gradually the the, the, the evil builds up behind it. But, yeah, it, it, it's a it's interesting that um, it, it didn't receive much pushback but it got some but you know i guess people have bowed in this idea that in the times of war you go along with the government the government has got a, a war to win and mm -hmm. they must know best and let, let's just yeah. ride it out and let's yeah. face it you know we, we can talk about the fact that the u.s army is segregated all the way through world war ii and we, right. we've done shows about the the racism about um latinos and and other minorities within the US and, and, and women and, and, and all that. So it's right. not like there isn't some kind of precedent for unfairness, even though, as you say, mm 
we are fighting, the Allies are fighting an enemy that is killing people based mm -hmm. on racial differences and 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 yet our own countries are not perfect. But we recognize it, I think. We recognize that we're we're moving in the right direction and we're yeah. it's anyway, it's fascinating. But anyway, I'll let you carry on. I'm just um my my words are popping out of my brain as they often do. Oh, that's great. So uh, I'm actually gonna is it okay if I turn to the language thing? Because I think yeah, it's sure, I think this yeah. is a great place to do it. So um, you're gonna see between this image and then there's gonna be another one afterwards. So I always get a couple questions. One is about were there Germans and Italians um, who were removed and interned like Japanese? Yes. Uh, and any historian who would talk about like and just say no, or there wasn't quite as many, there were not. Um, but here's the key difference. So when it came to members of the Italian and German community in the United States, the United States uh, government, the FBI, the Department of Justice, focused almost explicitly on nationals, so non-American citizens. And so internment um, is a very specific kind of legal term which means and is applied to um, enemy aliens generally. So it, the, the internment of enemy aliens, that was under the purview of the Department of Justice. The military did assist with that, sometimes with guarding some of the internment camps, sometimes with helping with um, you know, different uh, loyalty investigations, but internment was a Department of Justice. So what you see in this slide, this is a map of the internment camps. There's a lot more of them than there were for the Japanese American camps, which I'll get to in a little bit. So this is a map of internment. Um, there were Japanese nationals who were interned. Um, there were German and Italians who were interned, but they're predominantly nationals, they're immigrants. Um, there are some of the camps which we'll probably end up talking about later that kind of doubled. So like um, Tule Lake in California, that eventually became kind of a segregation center. I kind of refer to it as like a maximum security camp for people who were who were seen as troublemakers. Um, but that's internment. It's a very specific process and it applies primarily to people who are not American citizens and who are of ancestry with the places that we are at war with. So that's, that's the first thing I'll say with language. Um, internment is super specific. So if you look at the next slide, okay, so this, is incarceration. And this is where the language gets very important. So I will uh, fully tell you that I obviously need to know a lot about uh, internment as it applies to enemy aliens. My area of focus and specialty is on Japanese American, what historians are starting to call incarceration. Because the fact that most, again, overwhelming majority of the people of the Japanese community along the West Coast who were placed in these camps. And so that's what all the little uh, stars kind of sum up there. And then there's a nice shaded part along the West Coast to remind you of what the excluded areas were um, because they were overwhelmingly in this case, American citizens, internment doesn't apply. Uh, technically internment, it's not legally correct. It was used at the time um, there are plenty of oral histories of Japanese Americans who are in these camps who will call it internment. Um, they think about how it was described at the time. That was American language that uh, was used kind of interchangeably. But incarceration, I use that term to describe what happens to Japanese Americans because it makes more sense technically and legally as a definition. So because they're overwhelmingly American citizens, they are uh, suspected of potential disloyalty and subversion based on nothing more than their racial or ethnic uh, makeup. They are forcibly removed from their homes unless they're able to relocate voluntarily. So totally not gonna deny that. That was a part of the project. Um, but if you are not able to do that, you can't stay at your home. So you're removed. You cannot remain there. You are placed in a camp not of your choosing. So as you can kind of see, they're spread all over the place. They go down into Arkansas too. It's, it, it's really all over. And one of my favorite things is that if you look, a lot of those camps are actually in the exclusion zone. <laughs> so they're not even necessarily uh, outside of it. Um, these are American citizens who are not given due process. They're not given a fair trial. Um, they are essentially kind of demoted to enemy alien status. So their citizenship 
during the war doesn't mean much, to be honest, in terms of distinguishing them from uh, the enemy aliens. But because incarceration is not uh, specifically overseen by the Department of Justice or the FBI, because it's overseen by a, a separate kind of civilian agency, the War Relocation Authority, a lot of historians have tried to think of what is a way to explain what is going on to American citizens that doesn't downplay what's going on and that gets more to the heart of what actually happens here. And so incarceration is the word that a lot of historians are starting to use. Imprisonment, um, I will tell you that having looked at records, communications among the military officials, among government officials, plenty of times they refer to Japanese Americans as prisoners. Um, so that is a language that is used. Concentration camps, uh, that's language that is used again by the government officials and military officials in correspondence to describe all those camps that you see on that. So there's the language that's being used internally um, and there's the language that's being used to the public to communicate what's going on. Internment, evacuees, um, internees, relocation centers, the other phrase that's used in propaganda uh, referring to Japanese Americans who are taken from their homes and put in these camps, which are in usually very desolate areas. Um, they're referred to by the government as pioneers because they have a pioneering spirit. Look, they're going to go out and, and farm and turn this land around just like, you know, European pioneers did. So that's why um, if you, you hear different words, and uh, there are historians who still use internment because it's, the, it's a historical term. Um, and so there are historians who say, I'm still going to use internment because that was the term that was used at the time. Um, others are saying incarceration is better. In 2010, the Japanese American Citizens League here in the U.S. released a document, a resolution, where they pretty much said our organization is going to refer to what happened under Executive Order 9066 as incarceration or imprisonment. So also on that level, I will defer to the community that experienced sort of the legacy of this and uh, incarceration seems to be the more appropriate, the more appropriate term. Um, they're used interchangeably, but if you want to like st strip all kinds of debates over what this is down to the very like bare bones level, internment was one specific process. Mm -hmm. What you see on the map in front of you is something different. We have to create a whole new agency to deal with what we're going to do with Japanese American citizens. So to me, that's where the difference kind of um, hinges. Thanks but for explaining that. Yeah. So you, you're talking about the practicality of this, but also that how legally, constitutionally, could they get this set up? It, it, let's say one of the people they, they relocate and incarcerate happened to be a lawyer. Would he not be able to say, this is unconstitutional, I have rights? I mean, under what amendment, shall we say, are they making this legal? The only way that they are making this legal um, is that technically uh, all Japanese, no matter if they're citizens or if they're nationals, receive from the military. So the military is kind of behind this and planning this. They receive the legal designation of being an enemy alien. Now, is that constitutional? Can you like take away someone's say, no. Um, but the problem is, until the Supreme Court would step up and say, this is unconstitutional, this absolutely can't happen, it can happen. And there are cases that go up before the Supreme Court from Japanese Americans who purposefully challenge this. So before they're removed, there are curfews along the West Coast, which everyone uh, initially has to live under these curfews. Eventually they will apply really only to certain communities like the Japanese American community. But there are Japanese American citizens who purposefully defy um, curfews. There are a couple who try to enlist uh, in the military and are denied that opportunity. And they're doing this on purpose because they're trying to legally kick into place a, a legal challenge to this and hope that it gets up to the Supreme Court. And there are a couple cases that do, but the Supreme Court makes a series of uh, what are known as the worst, some of the worst decisions among the Supreme Court in American history. And a couple of them apply here. 
because the Supreme Court will basically say, um, this is what is happening now is completely legal and constitutional because we are at war and because these people cannot be trusted because they are fall into this kind of enemy alien definition, even if they're citizens, um, that's how this is possible. So it, it all hinges on what the highest court in the land says. And during this time period, the highest court in the land says, so this is it's the war is basically those three words basically underlined three times becomes the, the, the reasoning and the, yeah, it's the war. That's it. Yep. Don't argue. Yeah. Yep. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. But they try that. I mean, there are legal actions that, that we really, you know, they really do try this. Um, one that is uh, kind of successful involves a young Japanese American woman who will work with lawyers from ACLU. So this is a uh, Mitsui Endo who she will appeal her case up to the Supreme court um, by 44, the court will hear it and not say that incarceration being in the camps was unconstitutional. Um, instead, they will say it is unconstitutional to keep people of Japanese descent who have proven that they're loyal. That's unconstitutional to keep them there. So not the whole racial issues. That's not that's not a problem. But if Japanese Americans like Mitsui Endo can prove that they are loyal, hardworking, they're able to, you know, secure a job outside of the camp, they don't speak Japanese, you know, a whole litany of things, basically being loyal means you try very hard to not That's be the opposite of the basic innocent, innocent and prove guilty is that you shouldn't have to prove you're innocent. It's for them to prove that the Japanese American is guilty. So, I mean, that's the principle of, of <laughs> what... Of, fraternity of, of our of our way of life in France and Britain and America is that you know you are innocent until proven guilty why, why should Japanese American have to prove they're loyal it should it's, it's in the onus is on the, the government to say you are a risk because of and right. provide evidence of that individual or that family or that community's risk beyond just the well you're Japanese American and therefore you are a risk because it's right. a war again it, right. it, it, it is it's fascinating yeah. yeah. And uh, the, one of the interesting things that I've heard and and again, like, I mean, questions about this are great no matter what. But I've I've gotten questions before um, and other historians have of, well, considering the time period, consider of like you said, those three words, it's the war. Um, what's the solution? Like what if, if this is all under DeWitt, he has this it's he's convinced that this is bad. The Supreme Court backs what he's doing. Um, what, a, what was the other solution? A lot of historians would say the solution would have been to kept the West Coast basically under like martial law like they did in Hawaii. Um, that's, I think, a little bit too simplistic of a solution just because of all the, the problems of what that would look like on the West Coast. How would people on the West Coast respond to living under repeated curfews and whatnot? Um, I'm not sure that's a great solution, but uh, the idea that did American citizens have to be removed? And then if they were, did they have to go into the camps? Couldn't they have extended that voluntary removal? Couldn't, couldn't the, you know, the war relocation authority, authority have worked harder to put them in communities beyond uh, the West Coast? So that's getting a little bit off topic, but I think it's important of like, well, the-, the I what was gonna ask you what the alternative would have been and you know, yep. just kind of, wait a bit and maybe just kind of let the dust settle let the let the horror of pearl harbor subside a bit let the u.s feel they're getting into the war again and starting to control things and let everybody just calm down and and, and count to 10 almost and, and yeah. then the reassess yeah. if there's been no issues if there haven't been as you said you know japanese americans murdered or people you know dragged mm -hmm. out of the houses and beat out if that hasn't happened uh, you know okay so we can kind of just leave it as it is and carry on going i suppose but then the the I, the problem with suggesting alternative is you can't possibly now say how it would have gone. It might right. have gone really well. It might right. not have gone well at all. We don't know. We can only judge by what actually happened. So on mm -hmm. that on that subject, moving along, you know, the the, the, the choice of camps. You said that the the uh, the Japanese Americans have no choice where they go. So why did they choose those locations, and how did the the the, um, the process go of building them, and what were the, what were they to provide, and mm -hmm. who managed it, and I'll hand over to you, basically. Yeah, great. Um, so uh, there's a lot of 
a lot of decision making that goes into where the camps are going to be located. It's very easy, and I know I certainly kind of before I started researching this, and it does make sense. Like on the surface, it makes perfect sense. The camps are selected because they are in remote areas. So if you're going to make the argument that Japanese Americans being concentrated along the West Coast is a security risk, um, okay, well, then you find some of the most remote areas possible um, to kind of place them in. So like Manzanar, um, Topaz in Utah, which is essentially like desert mountainous area. You, you find the areas that are very isolated. That, I mean, like if we're going to approach it that way, it makes perfect sense. But the decisions are more complicated than that. And if you look through the records, there's like a, a checklist. The Army will help with this. So um, the Engineering Corps will, will work with the War Relocation Authority to find land to figure out where to put the camps. And there's like a there's a list of priorities. Um, number one of the priority is sort of work intern or work work opportunities. Where can Japanese Americans find work? How can we keep Japanese Americans busy? What can we have them doing? Kind of like idle hands, uh, you know, like if, if, if they're not doing anything, if people are just kind of sitting in these prisons, then that's going to build resentment. It's going to lower morale and we can't have that. That could be an even worse situation. So picking areas where there will be plenty of opportunities to put Japanese Americans to work is at the top of the list. Um, so you take that you find areas and land that will be easy to get. So uh, the Army and the WRA will really focus on areas that are perhaps already under control of like the Department of the Interior. It's already, it's land that's already used by the government. That's easy enough. Um, the Army can also use eminent domain. So if they decide that they wanna use Arkansas uh, and let's say the governor of Arkansas which he does because he's a raging racist at the time, says, absolutely not. I don't want Japanese Americans in here. Eventually, the government can override that and the camps are going to be in there regardless. And DeWitt certainly used the threat of eminent domain to get land given over for the construction of the camps. Um, but it's also land that needs improvement. So during the New Deal, there were a lot of agencies that look to do like infrastructure improvements. So building dams, building irrigation ditches, a lot of projects that would improve land, make it arable. So uh, easier to farm. All those projects take a budget hit um, once the war comes along. But if you have like 120,000 people, a lot of them are successful farmers. So a lot of Japanese Americans who lived along the West Coast, real, I mean, middle class professionals, but also really really skilled at farming and taking some of the land that might be overused or only used to grow certain things, they're able to transform it um, and grow it into different crops. So the idea is we can take Japanese Americans, build these camps and use them to continue some of these New Deal projects, especially irrigation ditches. So that's really, really big. If we can uh, put Japanese Americans to work building and completing those ditches, that's going to be really key. Uh, two of the camps in Arizona will be located on the same land as um, Indian reservations. So where Native Americans live, uh, the government has to technically work with them to get land for the camps as well. And there the idea is Japanese Americans can be put to work completing projects that are necessary for the reservations, but that had to be put on hold because no one really had the money to pay for it. But if you use Japanese Americans, you have to pay them because you know we're America and we believe in not forcing people to work. But you certainly don't have to pay them going rate. And there's certainly not a, a real need or desire to make sure that checks get distributed on time. Um, there's all kinds of weird things that make this more of a coercive labor. This is where we're into language again, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. You know, voluntary, forced, yeah. coercion, uh, it, it's all i mean you're on your book and by the way folks the link to the book is in the description below as it always is recommend it but yeah this use of language again and motivation what you tell the people in these camps why are they working and you know reading your book that they you know, as you say the checks don't always come and it's not they're not being compensated based on their skill levels and it's mm -hmm. it's a 
it's the second le- it's not as unfair as being locked up in the first place but it's yeah. another it's 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 salt in the wound in the, in the, mm-hmm. yeah that you're you're then punishing them financially and mm-hmm. and of course their properties we can go into that whole tangent of their properties that they've left behind mm-hmm. you know that there's that loss there that loss of earnings loss of businesses um but talk about this where you see what should be the language to describe the working coercion what, what how do you classify it I would classify it as, so I, I had a converse, good conversation with my publisher <laughs> about sort of how to approach this. So the title is Coerced Labor. Um, I will say in the book, I like to use the term prison labor more. Um, and for me, coercion and prison labor are, they go hand in hand, really. It's it's kind of the same thing. Um, and if, we're, if historians are going to get more comfortable with referring to Japanese Americans as prisoners, then the labor that they did, in many ways, for the state, so for the government, um, that's prison labor. It's not free. Technically, they sign contracts. And so that's sort of what this whole project hinges on. And that is, again, a really uh, good public relations move for the Army and the War Relocation Authority. So the whole argument is, we don't make Japanese Americans work. No one has to work. They're gonna get fed. They have a place to live. No one's gonna make them work. If they wanna work, they sign a contract. So the argument is we all know free laborers sign contracts. That's like, you know, at the center of what it means to be a free laborer in the United States, you sign a contract. But when you get into the contract, there's all kinds of like restrictions and basically you don't have a lot of say over your over your labor. You can't up and quit a job if you work for the camps. Um, a lot of these jobs are really hard manual physical labor. So you need to have special clothes, gloves, um, kind of like heavy duty work pants. When Japanese Americans left the West Coast, um, people have probably heard this phrase, they could only take what they could put in a suitcase with them. That was it. Um, so if you wanna get a job to make money, you need to buy the stuff that you need to do the job in the first place. So there's almost like these company stores that exist at the camps. And that's how a lot of Japanese Americans uh, go into debt because they have to like lay out money or they have to use like advancement in their wages to get the clothes to do the job. So it's, uh, and also you're you're imprisoned. Um, (laughs) You can either do absolutely nothing or like the language that the camp administrators use. Don't you want to prove that you're patriotic? Don't you, don't you want to do something? I mean, Americans like to work. It's emotional blackmail, isn't it? If if they don't, if they don't volunteer, then yeah, you're playing into, well, that's why you're locked up then because you're unpatriotic. There's a war to it. Don't you know people are, we're we're collecting salvage paper. We're doing this and you're just sitting here taking pay from us. Well, that's why we locked up. It's a, you can't win. It's a you yeah. know, heads you win, tails you lose. You lose. You can't. You can't get out of this in any way that makes you look good. Right. Um, right. And, and getting into debt and, and yeah. is, is 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 awful. And I I like the fact you're you're emphasizing the fact that you're not selecting these language terms out of any kind of agenda you're pushing. You're saying mm-hmm. that internment is is one thing. This is incarceration. So if it's incarceration then the next logical use of the word is prison work. It's not that you're choosing this, to, oh, this, this modern historian is trying to, you're not trying, you're just saying this is, this is how it should be. If these people are incarcerated, then therefore the work is prison work. You're not making a point. You're just saying what we've effectively been doing is we've been using the wrong terms for, for seven decades. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, to me, like, it really, when you get into the documents, when you do the research and you start seeing the language that's used by the officials, it becomes very clear that, you know, they don't see Japanese Americans as like these sacrificing patriots in these camps. You know, this is not relocation. They're not pioneers. Uh, DeWitt will, as early as, as early as like the fall of 1942, will okay Japanese Americans to be released from the camps or even the assembly centers to go do work for private employers. Um, who put pressure on him. He basically gets tired of dealing with farmers who are like, yeah, remove Japanese Americans, but can we make an exception because I need them to help, you know, harvest my beets or something like that. Um, 
And DeWitt's kind of torn because he's like, man, I don't want anything to do with this project anymore. Uh, also, he thinks, won't it look kind of weird to <laughs> release people who we just interned or, or taken away and imprisoned? Um, but he gets pressured uh, by FDR himself, by politicians who are trying to say we need to keep everyone happy. So he has a dilemma. He's trying to think, what what's the legal premise for doing something like this, for you're, you're going to release these people who we said couldn't be released in the first place. So how do you do this? So he consulted a War Relocation Authority lawyer, Maurice Walk, um, who basically walks DeWitt through the process. And Walk will use um, the idea of constructive custody, which typically applies to convict laborers. So it really is a concept that at the time applied in many ways to releasing prisoners, so people who are convicted of a crime, releasing them to go do work for private employers. And Walk will tell DeWitt, we have a premise for this, we have a precedent. Um, it's constructive custody. In a letter and a write-up to DeWitt, he says it's the same thing, like if you release Japanese Americans, same thing as releasing convict laborers. You have to have, uh, you know, there's more restrictions. That way you can still have custody over them while releasing them for work. So like to me, when I found that piece of evidence, like everything kind of came together. Like, all right, DeWitt, they're basing their decisions when it comes to labor off how legally the United States looks at releasing convicts for labor. It's, it's the smoking gun in a sense that you found that proves it's that they're treating this as a prison project, not, I'm using that in the broad term, rather than a relocation for the people's benefit. The, the, the way, the language they're using, the systems they're employing, the, the paperwork, the rules they're following are from the prison system, not from any kind of touchy-feely, huggy, uh, kind of looking after people. Um, yeah, and, and the other thing is DeWitt, um, this is where it kind of gets into military strategy a little bit, DeWitt and the Army are very concerned um, <laughs> about initially releasing Japanese Americans to go work for private, private employers because they're going to have to be guarded, which creates a very nasty image when you have, again, no matter how Americans felt about Japanese, um, Japanese American citizens, if you're looking out and you're seeing pictures of Japanese American, American citizens working under guard with people with guns, like that's an image that you don't... <laughs> you don't want to see. And also DeWitt is very concerned about how Japan might use that as propaganda. Um, so to kind of further say, look at the United States, look at what they're doing to their own citizens of Japanese descent, racist, terrible people. Um, and also uh, DeWitt is concerned that Japan will use that as uh, a, a means to treat American POWs even worse um, than they than they did. So it's this idea that it's a very complicated thing um, using Japanese Americans for work because if you make the wrong move, not only will you create a really terrible domestic situation here in the US, but you could kind of hand stuff over to the enemy. You're like putting something on a, on a silver platter and, and saying, look, yeah, we're a racist country. We force our citizens to go to work. Um, it's it's a conundrum, and it's something that DeWitt did not want to have to deal with, uh, but because <laughs> sort of it's a labor system, and and Japanese Americans will be released for labor, it now it's something he has to deal with. So, wow. So I mean, it's, it, this is intensely fascinating, and I'm really enjoying it. Um, so we we get to this. It, it, things are changing. So as the war's going on, you know that we now know that the risk that there is going to be no Japanese invasion of the West Coast or anywhere else like that. So how does this whole system end up coming to an end? Does it does it go out in a suddenly or is it a gradual winding down? It's a it's a gradual winding down, and there's a couple things that start to happen. One, like you mentioned, I mean, as as the war goes on and, and things start to change, it becomes clear. Oh, like okay, there's not going to be a Japanese invasion of the U.S. There's not going to be another air attack. Um, so perhaps we were a little too hysterical in that. Uh, the other thing, like I mentioned before, is the War Relocation Authority. Um, people start to hate it. Um, they see it as there's stories about inefficiency. The, the misuse of funds, the, the spending, the fact that the WRA is letting Japanese Americans leave to go work for private employers, their start 
to be a number of uh, strikes in the camps. So labor strikes, there start to be Japanese Americans who are doing this work start to strike for better pay. Um, they strike against the conditions. These are called riots. Um, and so when Americans read about, they're, they're not reading about a labor strike where Japanese Americans are protesting, you know, not having received their checks. They're reading of a riot, which means the War Relocation Authority can't even control the camps. And in a lot of these cases, in these strikes, the camp administrators do call the military in to uh, restore order. So Americans start to think, what, what's the point of this? Like, we're just going to have, we're just calling in the army over and over again. Um, we're taking them away from training and whatnot. Uh, the War Relocation Authority, as a result of that, gets hauled before Congress a number of times. They have to, uh, leaders have to testify about what exactly it is that they're doing in the camps. Why can't they maintain order? Um, what are you doing with the money exactly? It's, it's not a cheap project. Uh, so the WRA is going to have its budget slashed. So really, I mean, by like late 1943, early 1944, the WRA is going to receive a really sharp reduction in the money that it gets from Congress. Um, there's going to be administrators who are new dealers who don't like the fact that they're being looked at as like incompetent fools. They want to keep their government jobs. So they're going to resign. They're going to start to like leave the sinking ship and, and look for other jobs to get elsewhere. Um, and the WRA is going to, again, put like a spin on this and they're going to tell the public, they're not going to say, yeah, we're, it turns out we really suck at managing this. We're inefficient. We're a bloated organization. They're going to say, oh, we have finally realized that keeping Japanese Americans in these camps is bad for morale, um, especially the younger kids like the second generation Nisei. They need to be out and contributing to the war effort. Um, so we're going to start quote, we're going to start uh, the the program is called all out relocation, meaning we're going to start like approving as many people as possible to leave the camps. Number one reason that you need to leave the camp, you need to be able to prove you got a job elsewhere. <laughs> so and, and primarily that means a job in one of the wartime industries. So the WRA starts to kind of push, push people out and Japanese Americans you know, they, they understand what's going on. All of a sudden, right, they're being like, got to get a job, got to get out, right? I mean, you get your stuff together. Here's a, a money for a bus ticket and 20 bucks. Um, you know, go get a job wherever you can find one. They know what's going on. Like, they know that this the WRA is kind of, it's fizzling out. Um, eventually, the Department of the Interior will take over the incarceration project because they realize that WRA is just this very inefficient agency. And so really, by like, you know, if, if you're talking about summer 1945, a lot of the Japanese Americans have been resettled. And so they are kind of dispersed. Uh, they're, they don't even have a lot of choice in where they go after the camps. They're dependent upon the WRA to find jobs for them. Um, initially, you know, in 43 and 44, if they do leave, they can't go back to the West Coast because they're prohibited from going there. Um, but when you get to the end of the camps and the last the last camp is closed um, in 1946 and that's one of the higher maximum security ones that held the, the troublemakers um, but when you get to uh, again like august 1945 um really the only people that are left in a lot of the camps are the elderly so these would be elderly Issei. So uh, there, there are Japanese immigrants who do end up in the camps if they're not suspected of being disloyal. They don't necessarily go to an internment center. Um, they'll go to a camp. They can't get approval to leave because they can't get work in a wartime industry. They're enemy aliens. So they're, they're there. Um, people who physically can't work for whatever reason, they remain in the camps. And in some of these camps, uh, things get pretty bad because the camps were supposed to be self-sufficient. That was the whole plan. Um, to save money, the Japanese Americans would run the camps themselves, grow their own food, make their repairs, build their own prisons <laughs> in a lot of cases. So once you have all like the able-bodied Japanese Americans- They were gone. So now the infrastructure is failing. Yeah, the infrastructure is so failing. Um, you have nothing but elderly Issei who they can't they can't keep up the pace of like agricultural production. So in some of these camps, this period becomes known as a starving time because there's there's not enough food to go around. Um, and I mean, everyone does eat. So I'm not going to say that like anyone that people don't get food. 
but they're not getting enough. Um, they're definitely not getting enough because they can't maintain that level of production. So really um, the WRA, this, this whole project is a complete failure. Um, it's, a, it's a complete disaster. It's a con massive constitutional violations. And by the end of it, you know, the War Relocation Authority is just, a lot of people see it as a joke. And once this is all over, a lot of Americans can look back and say, wow, did we really need to do that? And in fact, in 1946, um, there's, the government is already going to start thinking about ways to compensate for lost property. Um, not much comes out of it, but it's like, it, it's pretty soon that people realize this really wasn't maybe the best course of action to take. But in just a couple of years, I mean, there's a lot of damage done for a lot of, a lot of families. Sure. And, and we're at the position now where it's being talked about again as a subject and your book and other books that come out, popular history, academic history, you know, you, there's presentations where you work at World War II Museum about, about this. And so the, we, we understand it now. Where, where are we sitting in the sense of the historiography of this now? Are, are, are people wanting to talk about it? Because it's, you know, we talk about it a lot on World War II TV, that the demographic of my channel is 40, 50, 60 year old males, mostly. Um, they're people who like to think that the Allies had the best, you know, the best aircraft. And we had General Patton, we had P-51 Mustangs. And, and, and this side of the war is, is one of the rather less glorious aspects mm -hmm. of it. And, and some of those people don't, we necessarily want their, their ideas of our heroic nations going to war being part of something that was inherently awful. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. younger people, I think, uh, you know, I'm thinking about my stepdaughters, are much more open to the fact that history is the stuff that happened, good and bad. And mm -hmm. the, the best way is to how can we learn from this? And as we said at the top of the show, this is still a very topical subject. So I like to think that this is a good now a good model we can use going forward of here's how not to do this situation again. Here's how not to define people and move them apart because of, 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 of if in a sense, racial profiling. So mm -hmm. where, 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 what would you like to see as, you know, your book's not out yet. What would you like to see as the result from it? I would like, so I, I would like to see more nuanced conversations about this because uh, like you said, it's, if you look at, you know, like the American history of World War II, we've, all, I mean, a lot of historians have already covered a lot of different topics to say, yes, like, I mean, there was a lot of, look at all the, the good that we were able to do. Um, look at, you know, the greatest generation, all of that. Um, but like you said, you know, the military is still segregated. Like there's still that issue. Um, there's no reason why we can't, one, make sure that Japanese American incarceration is as central to the story as something else on the home front, like women going to war or the double V campaign or anything like that. Um, one of the interesting things, and I, and I think to, to comment on where I think things are kind of going, and I'm really, really glad to see it going this way. I think there's a lot of popular histories that are coming out that are doing just that. And there are a lot of great work is being done on um, the men who served in like the 442nd yeah. um, where really interesting figures. You have, you know, these young men who have like the weight of the country on them. They have the weight of their community. There are a lot of uh, men who will protest and, and they, in the camps, they will protest the draft, um, heroic and courageous and brave in their own way. Same thing for the, the men who served in the 442nd. They're, they go and they serve their country, but in a lot of ways, they don't stay quiet about what's going on in the camps. Um, they use their positions to, to say, hey, you know, I'm fighting two wars. So like I'm, you know, like I'm fighting overseas for my country while my family is in a camp. And I think there's there's books that are coming out um, that look at at the men and the women. So there will also be Japanese American women who serve um, in, in intelligence units. So they and, and being interpreters and things of that nature, I I think just making it not this kind of random side topic, but actually integrating it into, into the, the story of the home front more generally, I think would do a world of good yeah. um, so that it doesn't seem like a kind of a weird sideshow to everything else. Yeah, it seems else. to be a bit, a bit of a taboo subject for a while. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean I've, incidentally, and it's not connected with what you're talking about, but it's connected in the sense it's something not talked about, is I'm working on a show 
uh, in a few weeks' time about the um, the killing of French civilians by the bombs, you know, the bombing campaign. And it's yeah. it's like because yeah. the museums here just kind of don't mention it. We all, everyone knows that lots of French die, but it's like we just don't want to only put that in the museums because it right. it sort right. of takes the spin off, it's the sign off things. You know, you're hearing about these heroic troops coming ashore and oh, by the way, but there was this collateral damage and this village got destroyed and hundreds of people were killed. So let's kind right. of we will ask answer questions if we're asked but we're not going to put it out there until people ask i think right, right. That, that's how we should be with this is that we should be honest about our terminology and and say incarcerated if it was incarcerated we could call it prison work because it seems that's what it was and mm -hmm. and just boldly accept what it was and say well this is what it was now mm -hmm. what can we learn from it how are we going to talk about it and how can we how can we move forward and, and, it, and as you say bring it as part of the home front story and it just mm -hmm. Which is what it is, um, and you know. It, so yeah, um, I, I've I've really enjoyed this, and um, I'd like to come you to come back on again at some point, talking about the other aspects of the Asian American. Maybe do a panel discussion or something because Stacy, my friend, who does her film about the four forty second, yeah, because yeah. that that would be something. You know, the perception of of Asian Americans these days with regards to World War Two, and it's interesting mm -hmm. because nearly all the World War Two and war movies I know that are in the pipeline in the next couple of years seem to have a minority focus somewhere on the line adam makos's book of devotion about korea is about yeah. a black, a, a black uh, african-american and a white guy and then there was a liberator alex kershaw's that covered you know the, the native americans in that unit and then mm -hmm. there's um dave gutierrez he's talking about the, the latinos and so there are these projects bubbling along that are trying to remind people you know the war was fought by lots of people and mm -hmm. there's other aspects within it that we should address and understand that there were there were different rules applied and it's been uncomfortable listening to some of what i've heard you say tonight it's like i mean it's it's there's no way of say hiding the fact that this was unfair and unjust and mm -hmm. and and legally not correct and yet it happened and so therefore let's embrace it and and learn from it i think that's right. the main thing right yep so absolutely. if you would come back on on a panel later on i think it'll be great so um yeah. well I'll just remind people we've got coming up and i'll say goodbye to you in a minute because that's been really i've really enjoyed it so folks um, tomorrow evening, we are talking about the Spanish volunteers in the British Army. That'll be really good. Then the following night, we've got Kevin Himmel coming on and talking about Mayen, the battle in August. So that was uh, 77 years ago this, this week. We're talking about that. But right now, and as usual, check us out on Patreon. Check us out on social media. The links to the book, Steph's book, is in the description below. And I urge you to go out there and read more about this topic because it really is fascinating, both Steph's book and other things you can find online. There are a lot of resources now about the, in, the internment incarceration, which there wasn't perhaps 10 years ago. So I urge you to go out there and, and, and delve into them. So, but right now it remains me to say, thank you very much, Steph, for joining us. Have thank you enjoyed you. it? Yes, very much. Thank you. Good. Well, I, I've, in, I've enjoyed talking. As, as difficult as it is a subject to discuss, it is, it, it's important to discuss. So there we are, folks. This is Paul Bernard for World War II TV. I will see you all again tomorrow night when we talk about the Spanish volunteers within the British Army. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.